The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazines. We have a special video for you today, Painting Figures from Photographs with Nancy Tankersley. I'm Nancy Tankersley. Um, welcome to my studio. Today I'm going to be mostly talking about um, the correct way to work with photos. Uh, I studied art in college where I learned to paint from life. Uh, I've spent a lot of years painting plein air. I paint still life in my studio from life. But I also find the photograph a very useful addition to my toolbox. Uh, I have learned over the years that if you're not careful, the photograph will take over and the artist in you will take a back seat and what you end up with is just a um, copy of a photograph. So we want, I want you to understand how the photograph can be used to aid in your create creativity but also add in the accuracy of the figures that you want to put into your paintings. After college, and I'm sure many of you experienced this, um, there was a general feeling that anybody that painted from a photograph was less of an artist and that uh, real artists only painted from life and uh, I bought into this too. However, when I started painting portraits, um, I was a busy mother with three young kids. I didn't have the time to uh, have models sit for me and I found it very convenient to uh, go out in the field, take photographs and then come back to my studio and paint from the photographs. And I did that for many years, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully. So what I'm going to share with you today is um, the tips for working successfully. But first I want to talk a little bit about how the masters work with photographs. And the truth of the matter is the masters, as soon as photography was invented, started using, the, using photographs in the creation of their masterpieces. The first one, uh, I think most people know that Edgar Degas was very um, involved in photography and actually even for a while gave up painting, was just mostly photographing uh, subjects. And then he started using uh, the photograph in the creation of his paintings, which is why so many of his paintings have interesting design and uh, seem to capture the, the models in, uh, say, mid-flight or in the middle of a a pose if it were a ballerina or uh, ri racing, if it was a jockey painting. Um, there's just a lot of uh, figurative work in Degas paintings that couldn't have been done without the aid of photography or a terrific memory um, and a lot of sketching. And the truth is Degas probably used all three of these methods to get his final figure. All right, these first five slides are uh, photographs and paintings by Edgar Degas, and, which were used in the creation of some of his masterpieces. You can see that he worked from black and white, sometimes he hand colored them, sometimes he flipped the images. All were efforts to uh, use the photographs in a way that was more creative than just painting from the photograph. The next group of slides is, uh, by, is Ander Zorn, uh, who also used photography extensively. If you notice the, uh, the second and third image, they appear to have the same figure, only they are flipped in, uh, in direction. 
And uh, I suspect that uh, Zorn uh, manipulated the photograph so he could have two different versions of the same gesture, the same figure. And then uh, there's a picture that I took this summer. I was fortunate to see the Zorn exhibit in Paris. And the very last wall of the exhibition uh, was plastered with huge black and white photographs that Zorn used in the creation of many of his uh, nudes and nature paintings. And then the last two, uh, one is an etching from a photograph that Zorn took. He often took his photographs, made etchings of them. That was an opportunity to study the value pattern. And then he would go on and create a full-blown, full-color oil painting. And that's the last slide. The next sample is um, Soroya. Now, Soroya, it's well documented that he would set up giant canvases on the beach. So he did a lot of his paintings in nature from life. But there are also some very complicated paintings where he probably used photography as a tool. One is the well-known masterpiece called The Tuna Catcher. And you can see by the next two photographs that Zorn probably used these photos in composing and uh, providing information for the, uh, the final product. And then the last five slides, one is by Cezanne. Then we have Gauguin, Toulouse-Lautrec, and finally Picasso. And you can see the photographic reference material and the final painting. So I think it's pretty, probably indisputable that uh, the masters did use photography. However, I think they had an advantage over modern day uh, painters in that most of the photographs were not very good. They were uh, kind of fuzzy, they were in black and white, and uh, they, limit, they were limited to a, a smaller number of values. As photography uh, became better and more uh, detailed and offered more color opportunities, artists just unthinkingly started painting what the photograph was telling them. And I, I think one of the most important things an artist can learn is how to simplify the photograph, just like when we go out in nature, how to organize the values, but also how to use the photograph to give you the information you need, which is about shape, and uh, how the shapes relate to each other. In other words, uh, how to correctly proportion a figure. Simply put, we need to treat the photograph like we're painting from life. And over the years, I've developed a method that works pretty well for me, and I hope it will work for you too. The first thing I do is I just print out a black and white copy of the image that I plan to use in my painting. I, I do black and white because um, converting value or colors to value is one of the most difficult tasks that an artist faces, uh, especially a beginning artist. It's really tough to understand how dark or how light to make a color to make it equal the value that it needs to be. So by painting from black and white, you've eliminated that difficulty. All you have now is shapes and values. And secondly, a photograph, you have the advantage that the figure is not going to move, so you can spend all the time you need in analyzing the photograph, measuring it, understanding it, just like you would when you were painting from life, but you have more time. So the first thing I do when I'm working for photograph, and I'm going to demonstrate as if a model was over off the camera, and I was going to figure out how tall this model is, what I would do with a brush is I would put the tip of the brush at the head of the model and the, um, my thumb at the bottom of the model. And then I would guesstimate where the middle was. And you do that by kind of rough measuring. I think most of you that painted from life have learned how to use your brush. You find the, you hold it like this and you drop a plumb line and right in the middle of the model so you already know how things line up. Sometimes you'll take your brush and you'll uh, put the brush from one shoulder point to the other shoulder point. Again, you'll start understanding how the shoulders are, how one shoulder may be lower than the other shoulder. You can do the same with knees, with feet. 
So basically you are using your brush when you're out in nature. When you're plein air painting, you're doing the same thing, making comparative measurements. When we have a photograph, we can be a little bit more precise. The single most important measurement that you need to make in understanding the uh, figure is where is the midpoint. So first thing I do is I draw a line at the top of the head and at the bottom of the feet. Next thing I do is I will measure, see how large this figure is, and I find that this figure is approximately 24 centimeters, which means that the midpoint for this figure will be at 12 centimeters. So I will draw a line across here. I forgot to mention, I learned after I bought many boxes of uh, clear plastic sleeves that if I bought a, a dry erase pen, I could use the same sleeve over and over and make different measurements during the session. So I recommend getting some plastic sleeves, dry erase pen, and slipping your images into the, the plastic sleeve. Okay, so right now I've already made an important discovery that her purse, her hand, the major, her head, all of that is above the center line. And uh, if you're an experienced artist and a pretty good draftsman, that may be all you need to know. But this is the single most important measurement you need to make. Secondly, I like to drop a vertical line. It doesn't matter exactly where it is. I just want to make sure that it's somewhere toward the center of the figure. And I recommend getting a um, T-square because it's really important to line it up with the edges of the paper just like you'd line it up with your canvas. So I'm going to draw a center line there. So what I've learned from this center line is that from the top of her head, which is really the highest point of her head is here, you follow the center line down. Her purse is all the way over on this side of the center line, and the center line bisects her heels down there. This is really an important thing to know for gesture because if you don't see this right away, you may end up drawing her uh, a little bit too straight. Now another uh, measurement I might make if I felt like I needed it is I would uh, bisect this line again so it would be uh, in fourths. And again, we were operating with 12 centimeters there, so six centimeters would divide it into fourths. And look at that, her hem rests right on the... Okay, so now I know my proportions of this figure. And I can go ahead and start drawing with the confidence that I'll get it mostly right. Um, again, I can divide the quarter up and I can see that her head is a little bit uh, larger than a half of this, so I'll take that into consideration when I'm drawing. I don't want to get overly uh, technical or divide the figure into too many different um, quadrants because I think that takes away some of the joy. I'm not trying to precisely repl replicate this figure. I'm just trying to make sure that proportionally she reads well as a figure. I might also do a few things that would um, exaggerate her pose. I like this pose. This woman is got her hands on her hip, is talking on a cell phone. She seems a little, maybe a little annoyed that somebody's late for lunch. I don't know. I like to read stories into things. So if I want to exaggerate that posture, I may swing her hip out even more um, over here. So I'm redrawing in a, in a bit. I might, I might draw a line here to indicate the tilt of her head from shoulder to shoulder to indicate the tilt of her shoulders. That's something I could even drop her shoulder down more if I want. Um, line here to indicate the tilt of her hips. And uh, that's probably enough at this point. Maybe I'll, I'll put a vertical here just so that I get this accurate. And I think that's enough to go on.
All right, when I first started painting, I was taught to put a full 18 colors out on my palette. Um, there were colors that you used for portraits, and there were colors that you used for landscape, and uh, it was all very confusing. Um, over the years, as I've painted more and more outside, I've learned to simplify my palette, and I'm a great proponent now of the limited palette. I do like to use what's called an expanded limited palette in that I have two versions of yellow, two versions of red, and uh, usually two versions of blue in addition to white. This is how I lay my, my palette out. Again, I'm a, a lim I am a limited palette proponent. Uh, I think you can mix almost any, any color you need with uh, just uh, some versions of yellow, red, and blue. In this case, I am using a Hansa Yellow Light a Indian yellow, naphthol yellow, a Lizarin permanent, and ultramarine blue. I have on my palette cobalt teal, which I'll talk about later. And over here I'm using titanium white. Uh, that's my go-to white. Sometimes I'll try flake white and some different uh, warm whites and things like that. And it's fun to try, but for most paintings I'm sticking with titanium white. You'll notice that I've laid my palette out from light to dark. So I'm really more interested in uh, keeping my palette organized value-wise than I am color-wise. I have a cool yellow, a warm yellow, a warm red, a cool red, and then your work horse ultramarine blue, which is generally regarded as a warm blue. If I'm careful and I keep my palette organized, I'll end up with all my light mixtures over here and all my dark mixtures over here. And that's why I put the white on this side of the palette so that um, it'll be closer to the colors where I'm mostly using the white in my mixtures. As far as brushes, I like a variety. For figures, I think um, the filbert gives you the most natural stroke that just seems to to go well with the figure it's a long fluid stroke i also keep a couple of uh, long flats that's actually a filbert that's a long filbert this is a flat this is a brush that um, it's a royal sable that i'll sometimes use for blending and then this is a uh, number two long flat that I'll use for my initial mapping or drawing. And then this is something I picked up the other day. It's got a slight angle on it, and I think that could be useful for details. As far as palette knives, this is the palette knife I use for cleaning my palette. And this is a palette knife I do a lot of painting with. That usually doesn't happen until the final stages of the painting. Um, I use, I'm trying to start using mostly non-toxic materials, so this is a non-toxic medium from uh, Gamblin that I like a lot. So anyhow, these are my tools. I don't recommend any particular brush. I don't recommend any, recommend any particular color. I think it's a under, get to know your brushes, get to know your paints and how they mix well together, and uh, you'll be a lot better off. So I do always start with a burnt sienna or another color, an Indian red, because they're inexpensive colors and because they're made of red, yellow, and blue, they don't... Um, they don't muddy up my colors unless I want them to. So I always have my burnt sienna on this side of the palette because once I actually start painting with color, I don't want to be dipping into it by mistake thinking that it was a Lizarin red. So it stays over there. These are my workhorse colors. Okay, well I think I'm ready to go. I, I've got my gesture. I've got my big measurements or my mapping points and I'm ready to start. I'll pick up a little burnt sienna, and let's see. This is a good time to plan your paintings. Um, if you're the type that likes to do thumbnail sketches, I think this is a wonderful time to sit down and try a variety of um, ideas where you're going to pay, place the painting or the figure. 
I think I'm going to keep her over here and I'm going to make her maybe this big. I want to have her up somewhat from the pavement because I, I like space down there. I don't like to place the figure right down at the end of the canvas. Um, having some space will allow you to move into the figure. And she is the subject here, without a doubt. All right, so I've determined that I'm going to make her about that big. I think I'm going to move her over a little bit more. Okay, so the next thing I have to do, I'm not painting her the same size as this. At least I don't think I am. Let's measure and see. All right, so that's the top of her head. Well, it's close. She's a little bit smaller than she is on the canvas. She's 21 inches there, so that's going to be 10 and a half inches for the midpoint. So I've got my midpoint. So I know now that the purse, the hand, everything is going to go above this center line here. Now I'm going to drop the center line. I'm going to put my ruler up there so I make sure that it is level with the size of the canvas. And I'm going to drop my, my center point there. OK, so that, that line mimics this line. Okay, one other thing, one other area of measurement that I forgot to talk about is understanding gesture is important and it can be aided by doing something like this. Get, guesstimating where the center line, the back of her head is, drawing a line there, understanding where the back of her figure is, drawing a line there. And then the swing of her leg. So I have, I understand now that the figure is something like that. And I'm going to try to replicate that and maybe even exaggerate it. I'm going to put a dot here for the quarter mark. I've been doing this a long time and, and pretty much eyeball it. All right. I'm going to keep that purse above that center line. Already I was starting to enlarge the figure as I was painting. And this is uh, kind of a natural inclination. My first lines were inaccurate. Skirt ends there. Now, rather than continuing with drawing and trying to be too precise, I'm going to block in the overall shape using a fairly um, dry brush. I don't want to get a lot of wet paint in here now, but I can get a little bit.
It looks pretty bulk, klutzy right now, but we'll be refining it as we go along. But I've got the major points. I've got this foot on the right side of the center line. I've got this foot on the right side of the center line. Okay. All right, now I'm going to figure out what else I'm going to do with this painting. Okay, so you can see um, there's not a whole lot going on in this painting. This woman is standing outside of uh, a, a busy store. There's bright sunlight. There's some uh, interesting divisions of shape in the background. And I'm just, just going to indicate some of those elements and uh, figure out how I'm going to divide this, cam this canvas up. I'm looking for the shadow pattern. I may bring the shadow that's cast from the building over to meet her. So what I really think about now is the vision of shape, a division, a vision of space, and how I can make it work for me against the figure so that I have some areas of sharp contrast and other areas of uh, soft contrast to help lead the eye. And I think I'm going to make a suggestion of some type of cast shadow here which is a device that will lead you into the figure. So you can see how I've already um, deviated from what I'm seeing. There is another figure in the shadow area. I don't think I'm going to put her in, but I am going to put some abstract shapes in the background just to, uh, to add some color interest. Let me clean it up a little bit. At some point I may have to go in and reestablish my lines just so I make sure that my uh, drawing doesn't go off track, so I'm going to put this bottom point, top point, and the middle right in there again, make sure I'm on track. All right, depending on the type of canvas you use, at this point you can resort to just lifting off the, pa the paint where you uh, want your light areas to be, or you can go in and you can apply white paint. But what I'm doing right now is I'm generally trying to understand the light pattern. A bit of light there. Nice big shadow that
taking a little ultramarine and going back in and redrawing a little bit, reestablishing the gesture. Where does her elbow end? The angle of this arm coming out. I'm not feeling like she's uh, lining up very well. So I need to go back to my ruler. I'm going to drop a line. From the edge of her hair, I think. and see where that lines up at the bottom of the figure. So I can see that from the edge of her hair should be the end of her foot. Let me put it up here again. So I may have gotten a little bit too big there. All right, now she's starting to take on a little bit more of the attitude that I want to uh, convey. Don't want to have a tangent there at the end of her skirt, so I'm going to raise the um, bottom of the door just a bit. Okay, and don't forget the all-important shadow. All right, I think I'm ready to go. So I've established the center line vertically, the center line horizontally. I've divided the vertical line into fours, which has told me that it, her um, shoulder is about the, the midpoint in that quarter and that the end of her skirt, her skirt uh, stops at the midpoint on the line there. So these are all things you would be doing if you were working from life, and we're using the photograph and this method to help establish those points of information, things that will help you uh, in drawing a more convincing figure. In my studio, I use this method for my drawing, and then I do a lot of my painting just from my monitor, um, and that's another uh, way you can work. Uh, I generally even work from black and white on my monitor because I want to be able to make the color decisions. I don't want to have to do what ex is exactly in the photo. This is color-wise a pretty uninteresting photograph. So let's see, what am I going to do? I think I'm going to uh, put her in a green shirt. So the first thing I'm going to do is mix up a dark green and paint in the shadows. Not going for a lot of subtlety right now. I'm just trying to get that big overall shadow pattern that I see in her sweater. A little bit of shadow there. Clean my brush. And then I'm going to consider what color I'm going to make her skirt. It is a denim skirt. I think I'm just going to stick with that. I may push the, uh, the light areas a little bit toward green, just for harmony's sake, but that's the decision I can make as I go along. So, 
the shape of the, the shadow that the purse casts on her figure is really important for defining the gesture and the figure. And there's a little bit of shadow right down there, maybe a little bit there. I'm going to make her boots red. I think that'll will be a nice addition to color rather than the brown that they are. So I'm going to, this one boot is almost totally in shadow. I'm just going to block it in, kind of a nice boot shape. Not getting too much into detail at this point. Go back and I am going to keep her a blonde. I like that overall color. And I'm mixing up just kind of a warm mixture of green, yellow, and uh, red, yellow, and blue <laughs> for the shadow color on her hair. All right. So now I've, I've established pretty much the, uh, the colors on her body. I'm going to think about her purse. I'm going to stick with the red. I'll probably throw some other colors in there, but so she's going to have matching purse and shoes. I think that might be out of fashion, but oh well. Didn't mean to do that because that's in the light. What I'm really trying to do is keep my lights, my areas that are in the light and the areas that are in the shadows, clearly divided at this point. Let's go back to the sweater. I'm going to reach into my green, add a little white, a little yellow, get to what I think might be the right value for this sweater and light. That's pretty green. Carefully block it in. There's a little bit of light down here. Those arms are mostly in the light. You notice how I've redrawn her arm as I'm painting color. As I notice that things may be a little out of proportion, that's when I make corrections. I'm essentially working uh, from large to small. I'm trying to see the large shapes, trying to get those shapes correct, and then moving on to the next shape. So I'm going to do my denim skirt in light now. Put a little yellow in it to keep it have, has a slight green cast. Block it in quickly. Okay. All right, so she's starting to take shape. Let me get the light area of her boots. So that will be my warm red, maybe a little bit of my warm yellow. I want to really pop some color here, and a little white. And I'll look at the photograph, and I can tell from black and white which areas are getting light, and paint them in. Not getting too involved in the wrinkles. I'm still going for overall form at this point. Can't forget her legs. Burnt sienna is a good color, good skin color for Caucasian skin in the shadow. You can get a lot more subtle with it by bluing it or warming it, but it's a generally it's a good place to start. So there. There are like, and I'm going to mix.
mix the bright color of the purse. Basically, the purse is like a, uh, a block or a rectangle, and I'm trying to find the, the side of it. This is the side. And the bottom. This is the bottom. I'll suggest the straps here. I'm still painting with a fairly large brush. Okay. At this point, I'm going to leave the figure and I'm going to go on and resolve the rest of the things that are happening. So my color photograph, it's a pretty nondescript color. It's a pavement color. So me, as the artist, I can do whatever I want as long as the value is right. So I'm going to mix a lot of white. When you're mixing a white, a light color, it's best to start with your white and then add the color in. I'm going to add a little uh, yellow, just sunlight. Maybe a little burnt sienna. and a little bit of blue. I'm going to paint this, the uh, sidewalk, a little darker than I might be seeing it because I want room to go back in later and add some highlights. Dipping into my solvent just to make things flow a little bit better. And I've got this got a nice gray color quickly. Start to Chisel the figure a little bit with the background color. You've noticed I've deliberately um, reduced the amount of skirt that's on this side of her leg. I think it uh, emphasizes the gesture a little bit better. Gives her a little bit more swing in her hip. So again, that's you, the artist, taking control of the photograph using the photograph for the basic information you need, which is proportion and values, and then doing it your way. Another beauty of using the uh, limited palette is that your backgrounds will always harmonize with um, your figure. Backgrounds really should be built out of the colors that you use in building the main focal point. Uh, for instance, like in a portrait, people are always saying, well, what, how do I make the background? What color do I make the background? Well, the background really should come from the color mixers that you used and doing the portrait. And then your painting will have harmony. Okay. And I need to paint the cast shadow. The cast shadow, people often ask what color is a shadow. It is usually made up from the same family of colors that the object in light is. So this um, shadow is going to be more or less in the brown family. It might have a little bit more blue to it, but it's got to harmonize with the rest of the, uh, the pavement. The pavement. All right. Now, what's interesting about this um, painting is that it's a glass. Uh, there's two doors. And the sun is beating down on those doors. Even though it looks very dark in the shadow, you as a painter have to figure out how to convey that without giving the idea that that part of the painting is in shadow. So you need to check, check, uh, pick a value and a color that is going to um, help you make that, create that illusion. I'm going to go ahead and block in, in color, the dark area of the background, and I'm going to do that with ultramarine blue and a little bit of alizarin crimson and a little bit of my Indian yellow just to, to dull it a little bit. Okay. 
So again, I'm f using the same procedure that I did with the figure. I am establishing my areas of shadow And then I'll go in and establish my areas of light. Okay. I don't want to forget the shadow down here. I feel like I need something for balance. And it could be any number of things casting shadow down there. It's a little darker. Okay. All right. I'm going to, it has to be uh, fairly dark without getting too dark. So I'm going to try this and see if I can relate my values well enough that I can give the illusion that that's a pane of glass. I've made a kind of light lavender to suggest the uh, metal frame of the door. I'm just kind of playing with color. I'm not trying to be accurate as to what the, the um, camera has recorded. I'm trying to um, pick colors that I think will work, but also make a pretty painting. moving the center of the door over a little bit. I kind of like the idea of her head being framed in a dark value. Okay. All right, I've reached the point where everything is uh, has paint on it. Now it's time for me to start refining this painting. If you've done, taken your time setting up the figure, making sure your proportions are right, that it's placed in the right place, that you understand the values, the, um, where the light is hitting the, light, hitting the object and where it's in shadow, if you've got all those things right, it should be working as a painting at this point. And I can stop when, wherever I want. It may be my personal aesthetic that I like things loose and suggestive and I stop not too far from, uh, from where I am now. Or I could be the type of painter that likes to paint the nuances and the, 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 my, the fine detail and the small shapes, in which case I will continually keep progressing toward a more finished painting. So I'm going to take this painting a bit further until I feel like it, I've said enough.
need to introduce some of the color that I've used in her sweater just to suggest some things happening behind this pane of glass. That value shift from that to that should tell the viewer that this is where the shadow ends and the light begins. This has a little bit more lavender in it. I kind of like that. It's got the brown, but it's got a little more lavender. I'm going to go back here and adjust this shadow a bit. Okay, now it's time for me to pick up some smaller brushes. Oops. I see that I have left this largely undone, and that's okay. Now I'm going to be painting the light side of her hair, dipping back into one of my light mixtures. The beauty of um, working with just five colors is that if I spoil a mixture or pollute a mixture and need that color again, it's not that hard to get to it. I think that needs to be a little pinker. Trying to refine the hand and this arm a little bit. I'm gonna make her purse read a little bit better. If you remember when I started and blocked the figure in, she was pretty uh, hulky looking. <laughs> but as I refine using negative shape in the background, she starts to take on a more feminine form, a little bit more graceful. But in the, in the beginning, my proportions, her head in relation to her body, in relation to her skirt, in relation to her, her lower extremities and her boots, were fairly correct because of the way I laid the measurements in. I used my own method of measuring. You'll find, as, if you work with this um, method, that 
you'll develop your own needs as far as measuring. So it's, you know, it's a system that you make your own, just like when you're painting from life. Things will start to make sense to you after work, you know, uh, working a certain way for a while. put my little brush away for a few minutes until I have a chance to analyze where I'm going now. I'm feeling that the shapes are all fairly accurate. Oh, that line goes down that way. That was a little bit of an error there, so I'm going to correct that. Okay. I want to take some of the light color and uh, spread, or the warm red, and spread it around a little bit, suggest things that are happening inside the store. Just kind of some abstract shapes that could be believable. Make that too light, because that will disrupt my uh, my large dark, and I want to keep that large dark. Alright, so now I want to go back and perk up some of the color in the figure. I want to drop this, this shoulder a tiny bit too. I'll give her a little more gesture. Okay. Got a little too light on that shadow there. I need to go back and darken it.
That says a lot about the shape of her hip to get that cast shadow correct. Okay, so the last touches I'm going to do, and I could continue on this further, but um, I want to move on to a, another demo to show you how to incorporate multiple figures into your paintings. So I'm just going to um, hit some highlight on her hair. Why is the highlight important? Because it makes the head dimensional. And even though you can't really see it, you know that it's got to be there. If, she, if her head is a round shape and light is coming down and beating, touching that head somewhere, it's going to have a highlight at the area that's closest to the light source. So by adding the highlight up there, it gives her head a little bit more shape. So the last concept I want to uh, talk about and demonstrate in, in this uh, painting is the concept of using a color uh, as an aid to drawing your eye to a certain area. And, and the color should not have been used in any of your mixtures in your painting. So this is why I have saved my um, cobalt turquoise. And I'm going to use a little bit of this color on her cell phone to draw the eye up here because that's really what this painting is about. She's talking on her cell phone, she's um, deep in conversation and it's just a very contemporary modern image and the cell phone is an important part of it. And you see how that color now uh, really um, draws your eye to that area. Now I can refine it a little bit, get an even smaller brush, and put some areas of dark around it that will help make that cell phone, even as small a shape as it is, it will become an important part of the painting. You know, many of you may have been taught you have to paint what you see, but I think we've learned that we don't always see correctly. We think we see things and they aren't really true. So I think as a painter, the better, the better saying is paint what you know you should see. And this is a perfect example of that. The head, even though I don't see this highlight, I know it has to be there. So I add it in my quest for making this painting more readable and understandable.
Now I could repeat that alien color a bit, but just alter it a tiny bit. Just add a little more color. I don't want to be too precise with the background. I want uh, the background to stay behind her. I want the basic shapes to be there, but not a lot of detail. I'm still not happy with her left arm, so what I'll do is I'll go back and simplify.
if you have a problem area, one, one of the ways to resolve it is to minimize the, um, the edges. In other words, make them soft edges, make uh, the contrast less, the contrast meaning that the value shift left less than um, you might see it on the photograph. Maybe direct the eye down here with the sharp edge. Direct it away from this area. Okay. But I still want that little pinpoint of light on her hip, but do I have it placed right? There. By bringing that waistline up a little bit, it, uh, I think it made the gesture a little bit more believable. All right, so I hope you've learned that um, photos can be a wonderful aid for measuring uh, to get the accurate proportions of a figure, to get the uh, accurate gesture of a figure, but that um, you shouldn't be a slave to totally copying the figure. Uh, the photograph sometimes gives you too much information, so you need to put on your artist's cap and decide what's necessary and what's not necessary. I always recommend working from black and white so that you're the master of color. You can uh, put any color you want to and that makes sense to you. And I think it makes a whole lot, uh, the act of painting the figure a whole lot more fun. Imagine how great it would be learning to paint multiple figures in one single painting. After all, the ability to bring the human form to life on a canvas is a skill many people marvel at, though it's not just painters who look in awe upon such work. People with no great interest in art are still mesmerized by lifelike paintings of the human form. For many years, however, the only way to create such a realistic piece of art was to stand outside for hours on end, painting every detail as lighting conditions change. Yet thanks to the invention of cameras, you can now capture every detail in a photograph and paint figures in the comfort of your own home or studio. With this all-new release from Lilidal Art Instruction Video, you now have the chance to learn how to produce such paintings yourself. This video training is conducted by leading figure painter Nancy Tankersley.
When you master the skill of painting from photos, you'll save a lot of time that would otherwise be spent outside, no matter the conditions. In this training, you will discover Nancy's advanced method of making one painting from two separate photos. The truth about adding detail to a face in your painting when you can't see any of the original photograph. The box technique Nancy uses to paint two figures right next to each other. Plus, a whole lot more, including how to paint the sky in just 19 seconds while still ensuring it looks realistic. Learning to paint from photographs is a skill many figure painters wish they possessed. Now, thanks to Nancy's teaching method, acquiring this skill for yourself is now a real possibility. Painting Figures from Photographs with Nancy Tankersley is available on DVD and streaming video now. That was Painting Figures from Photographs with Nancy Tankersley. If you want to learn more about that video, you can find it at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's get right to our interview with Nancy. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air Magazine. Today we're with Nancy Tankersley. Nancy, welcome. Thank you, Eric. I'm so honored to have you in the studio with us today. Well, I'm delighted to be here. So uh, I'm very curious. You, you have become uh, this overnight success. Everybody's talking about you. Everybody's <laughs> talking about your work. But you, you're not an overnight success. No. I know that. And uh, so how long have you been painting? I've been painting since I was a teenager, I think. Um, maybe even before then. I, if, the whole story is um, I, my, my brother was given a John Nagy Learn to Draw set and uh, he did nothing with it so I helped myself to it and I started going through the lessons and, and I was hooked. Was this a correspondence course? It was a, a box set that yeah. they were selling at the uh -huh. time and it took you through shapes and perspective and shading and, uh, and all the, the building blocks and uh, I was fascinated by it and, and quickly took to it and then spent most of my time drawing and sketching and then I um, borrowed his uh, model car oil paints, you know, the, that came in those little... Yeah, testers. Yeah, and I got a, a picture from National Geographic and I did my first oil painting with those. <laughs> <laughs> they were very shiny. Very shiny, yeah. <laughs> I did a, a portrait of a little girl. And uh, so from then on, I was pretty sure I wanted to be an artist. So and, you were... What, 12, 13 around yeah, that time? Yeah, adolescent, I think. Uh -huh. And uh, then I, I studied art in college or in high school, and I was discouraged, of course, like everybody was. Tell or, me about that. Well, you know, the guidance counselor would say, well, you'll never make a living. You ought to go to uh, study uh, art education. Um, and I said, nope, nope, I want to I wanna be an artist. But I didn't come from a family of artists. Um, we, we didn't really have any knowledge about art as a career. We didn't even have any original artwork in the house. So um, I ended up going to a college in Ohio based on somebody I met at work. I went to Miami University and studied art there for two years. Um, I got a pretty basic, a good basic education there, but I, I really didn't know what I was going to do with it. So what year would that have been when you were in college? That was 1967 and 68, okay. 69. And, uh, at that time, I was dating my husband, and uh, it just seemed like a better idea to, to get married. <laughs> so I did, and uh, he was a naval aviator, and we moved out to California, where he was going to the postgraduate school, and that's where I wanted to finish my degree. And I couldn't find an art program out there, and uh, I ended up getting a degree from University of California at Santa Cruz in a, a, a major called Community, community Studies. Mm -hmm and um, which was basically social work. Mm -hmm. So I got my degree out there. We moved back across the country to Jacksonville, Florida, and I discovered that people were actually um, paying artists to do portraits. I had kind of thought that portraiture was, was dead, that photography had taken over and, and nobody wanted painted portraits. And I'd always liked doing portraits in college. I found I was fairly good at it. Mm -hmm. 
So I started doing portraits in Jacksonville, Florida. And, and you were doing commission portraits? Commission portraits. So how did, how did you discover that people were paying for portraits and who were they? What, what? I went to, I forget how it was, I went to an art show in Gainesville. Of, you know, it was through American Artist Magazine. Mm -hmm. I saw an article on a woman named Man Marie Kenyon who did portraits and it turned out she was from Jacksonville, Florida. And I went to a show and I saw her beautiful portraits and I thought, wow, I can do this. <laughs> so. I started doing some portraits in pastel. I also had a, a friend that I'd met through a babysitting co-op that saw my work that I was just fooling around with, and she had been a copywriter for an ad agency. Mm -hmm. She said, I've worked with a lot of artists, and she says, you can do this. <laughs> she says, you, you know, you've got the talent. So she was very encouraging. She suggested I just take some time every day and uh, go into my studio, which was a fourth bedroom at that time, and she says, if you don't feel like painting, you just sit and read an art magazine, or you clean up your desk, or you do something, but you just develop the habit of painting. And uh, she was a writer, so she had had a writer with you know children, so she had done the same thing. Right. So it's really, she, really the same discipline, isn't it? It's it is, your, totally. You just have to force yourself to do it. Exactly, and sometimes the muse doesn't strike, and sometimes when you least expect it, it does. Right. So anyhow, I, I uh, became a portrait painter, and I had three children and a husband who was gone half the time because he was flying off carriers, but it, it all came together very well. Um, and I was finding myself booked, uh, you know, six months to a year in advance, and could have gone on happily doing that for a long time, except my husband got transferred to Washington, D.C., so we moved up there, and I thought I would just pick right up where I was and I found I was a very little minnow in a great big ocean in Washington, D.C. And, you know, it took me a while to uh, get my first portrait clients. I was also starting to realize that there was a lot I didn't know, that I could copy a photograph pretty well because um, I had the drawing skills, but I, I didn't know anything about um, really color, you know, cool temperature, warm temperature, um, edges, uh, designing, all of that was um, something I just hadn't, hadn't uh, received in my education. So I started taking some classes and some workshops um, at the Torpedo Factory, which is in um, Alexandria, Virginia, mm. and uh, started picking up some things, but it wasn't until I got my first studio outside the home where I started really self-educating. Um, Why did that change? What, what was it about having the studio out of the home that, that helped you grow? I think it was the isolation. And by then, all three of my children were in school. And, and I had the time. And I felt, well, I've got a studio outside the home. I must be a professional artist. I better get serious about this. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing I did was, and I was, I was selling art by then, but I had paint a lot of paintings, and a lot of them would be lousy. And then every now and then I'd do one that would be so good, you know, I would amaze myself. <laughs> and I'd think, well, the next one's going to be just like this. And then the next one would be, just as bad as all the other ones because, you know, sometimes I think the muse truly does take over and it's like magic and all of your decisions are correct and it all flows and you produce something really well. But most of the time it's a struggle. So um, I realized I needed to understand more about what I was doing. So the first thing I did was I spent a year teaching myself color by painting still life in in like one color. I'd paint an all white still life, I'd paint an all black still life, all yellow, so that I could see the nuances in color. Mm -hmm. And I started to learn, to understand, you know, the difference between a warm yellow, a cool yellow, and how to get there. Mm -hmm. So that was a really valuable year. And um, some of the still lifes I, pres I, I did during that year uh, got me into my first gallery. And uh, at the same time, I was still doing portraits. Um, I'd seen some paintings of uh, people on the beach, and uh, my gallery owner suggested I, 
I'd tr give that a try. Mm -hmm. So I uh, took my daughter and her girlfriend and another child out to the beach and shot a bunch of photos. And then I was off doing all these figures from photos. <laughs> 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 and uh, that was pretty successful too. Uh, it got me in a gallery in Carmel and a, actually a gallery in uh, Houston. And uh, I did that for, for a number of years doing all these figures on the beach. Um, I'm a little ADD. I get a little tired of doing the same thing over and over again. So right. I, I, you know, I think when you get you burn out on a subject, it starts to show. So I had another gallery owner at that time who said, "Well, why don't you do people in restaurants?" Okay, hmm. I'll do people in restaurants. <laughs> we were in, actually in New York. She and I had gone there for some reason, and so I started shooting pictures and of people in a restaurant. And this is when digital cameras first. Um, became popular and I had my first digital camera mm -hmm. and uh, I just picked up the camera shot a few people across the room then when I went home and started looking at those photographs and and zooming in I started to realize the, the potential that there was in digital photographies for the artists because before when I had been doing um, painting from photographs I had to get a really good photo in order to make a really good painting right and I essentially was copying the photo, mm -hmm. um, which is really not a good thing for an artist to do. But digital photography allowed me to paint a lot, to shoot a lot of pictures, to learn how to manipulate them to my best advantage as a painter. And uh, so I, that was another step in my education. I want to stop you there for just a second mm -hmm. and go back to that statement that you said that photographs, copying photographs isn't necessarily for artists. There's probably somebody who's watching this right now who needs to understand that. Could you articulate that a little bit? Yes. Um, I think anybody can be taught to copy a photograph. And then you have to ask yourself, is that art? Mm -hmm. um, I think the true artist has to take from the photograph what is necessary information to make a wonderful painting, but leave all the rest of it. It's just like plein air painting. When you go out, you have to edit, edit a scene. You have to learn to edit the photograph and um, make the painting truly your own. I think there's, you know, in, in an age where um, paintings can be created by the computer, I think it's more important than ever for the artists to insert themselves between the technology and the painting. And um, that's why um, I truly believe the photographs are a wonderful aid, but they're also very dangerous for artists that don't know how to use them. One of the, one of the compliments that will happen when you are, you're outdoors painting or I'm outdoors painting is someone will inevitably walk up and say, oh, it looks just, just like, like a, a photograph. photograph. <laughs> I know, and you go, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not being very creative then, then am I? <laughs> well, they think, they think they're, they're uh, doing you a favor by saying that, but. Well, see, that's the problem with photography. Everybody holds painting up to the standard of photography. And I right. think that's why modern art happened. It was a, um, a rejection of uh, seeing as the camera sees. And of course it went way, you know, beyond where it needed to go. But um, I think for artists need to learn to see naturally and how the eye really sees. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's talk about the development of artists. And I want to continue your story, but because we're on this thought process. Um, it, it crossed my mind that when I was first painting, just being able to paint like the photograph was a good thing, I thought, mm -hmm. because it was, mm -hmm. it, I, it felt like I could measure it against something. Uh, but what do you tell your students? What is the process of learning like for them? Well, I tell them that, uh, you mean in regards to photography? Well, in, in regards to, you know, making, you know, where do they start? How do they graduate from here to okay. here and so on? Well, I think um, drawing, accurate drawing is essential. But that said, I think it's drawing is a um, activity that gets you to a place where you can accurately put marks on the canvas. Um, I discourage my students from drawing complete drawings on the canvas because if they find as they're into the painting they've made some errors in the drawing, they're gonna be less likely to correct those errors. 
So drawing is an activity that uh, you gain the skill, this, the hand-eye coordination you need as a painter. But I, that said, I do really emphasize correct drawing. Then from there, it's all about design and values and um, seeing values correctly and uh, designing a painting so that people will immediately uh, want to look at it. Uh, artists get bogged down in details thinking that that's going to sell the painting or make people look at it and it doesn't happen. It has to be a really wonderful design to pull them in and then you can uh, treat them with detail. You know, you, you like a magician, you lead them through the painting where, where you place your detail. And then the last, the last to me, uh, least important is color. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of people out there who think that's a, a terrible thing to say, but I think um, if a painting is, is done in correct values, color is not nearly as important. And that's why I have my students work from black and white photos so that they can put their own color either through their creativity or their memory or you know whatever um, they want to do. And that's, that's kind of the fun of, of painting as you start to own the reality of, you know, that you see. I, I, I like that. Uh, um... Uh, this is exactly the process that I go through in my teaching as well, is mm -hmm. I think that color complicates everything. Mm -hmm. And I've seen too many people give up painting because they get frustrated fast and they just, they, their self-confidence is low, they don't feel right. like they have talent, and so they give it up. So I try to start them with, uh, first off, and, and this is probably opposite of what you suggest, but I basically start them, if they have no drawing experience, I start them by tracing a photograph and just big shapes mm -hmm. and then placing the values in there. Mm -hmm. And then, and that's just kind of their very beginning stage and then, you know, hope to get them to the point where they can do this on their own without a photograph in the future. But I think this values thing has been really underplayed. Oh, and, yeah. you know, because color is so complicated. It, it doesn't have to be, mm -hmm. but in the beginning, you know, you, you, you get the colors wrong because the, the, the values aren't right Absolutely. in the colors. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, the old saying, uh, color gets all the credit, value does all the work. Right. And I to totally believe in that. Right. Um, and design does the other part of the work. Yeah, design is crucial. And then the last thing I think is um, edges. After my students are comfortable with the, the other, uh, which is drawing, design, value, mixing color, then I start to really concentrate on edges because I think edges are what separates a, a pretty good painter from a really great painter. And so can you articulate that for somebody who might not really edges, understand? Edges, it means um, you, you have two types of edges. You have hard edges where things you know, you are delineated very crisply and then you have uh, very soft edges where like one shape seems to flow into another shape. And it's learning how to create those edges and there are different ways to create the edges and then where to place them in the painting because how you place those edges has a lot to do with how people look at the painting. They n normally go first to the area of hardest edges. Right. So it's usually the, the eye goes to the sharpest edge and usually the most contrast. Isn't that exactly. pretty correct? Yeah. And so if you're trying to, for instance, if you were doing a portrait which uh, you, you know, the part of the head is further away than, than the mm -hmm. part you're seeing, so that edge would go softer, I assume? Abs yes, absolutely. Unless yeah. you're trying to draw the eye to that, that other ear or something, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually when I teach portraits, I, I try to get my people to envision the box, you know, envision that head as a box where you have the top of the box, the sides of the box, the front of the box, and uh, you know where it, the box turns, you know, is where you have uh, the highlights. And you know, I—it's uh, funny. In the last ten years, everything I'd learned, and I've learned a lot from different teachers because I've taken a lot of workshops, and uh, it's all come together. And and what I think I've really learned as a teacher is that. Um, once you learn the main concepts in a big, simple way, then it all makes sense and you can start then breaking those concepts down into more and more sophisticated um, truths. Like uh, you don't tell a, a first-time painter, um, cool that red, 
Mm -hmm. You know, that's a more sophisticated um, instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's almost like a funnel, right? Yeah. So at the, when you're entering the funnel at the top of the funnel, you give them very, very basic, relatively unsophisticated yeah. data. Yeah. And then as they get a little bit more experience, you, you kind of narrow it down and you narrow right. it down and further down to right. the point where then you get into the, the crisp details. And the nuances. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like when I first, I started with portraiture and, you know, I, I was told to paint, paint what you see, you know, paint what you see up there. And um, so I would try to paint it and I'd try to get the head to go back. And I didn't have the understanding of the basic shape that, you know, I'm looking at this plane here and I'm looking at two planes there, plane there. If somebody had told me that 30 years ago, I think it, it would have saved me a lot of, uh, trouble in some of my commissions. Well, you probably weren't ready for it then. I think maybe I was. I don't think I had a teacher that told me um, to think so basically. There's something about, um, instructors all have their specialty and mm -hmm. they're, they like to give their specialty. Like if you use that color, that's going to make your sky so much more beautiful or that color is going to do this. And you know, they'll give you a list of specific paint you have to buy. and. And uh, I, I don't believe that. It's kind of like golf clubs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, this yeah. golf club is going to make you a better golfer. Yeah. There's nothing that's going to make you a better painter except a good grasp of the, uh, the concepts that help you turn a two-dimensional surface into a three-dimensional appearing surface. So again, I start with the very simple concepts. I, I make people, I try to get them to understand them. And then the mo longer I work with people, then the more we get into nuances. Mm -hmm. uh, so. so you said something earlier that I, I wanted to just bring up for the, for the viewer, and that is that you take workshops. I do. And, and, and the one thing that I think we assume is that when someone gets to the stature of someone like yourself, mm -hmm. where you're a highly accomplished painter, we assume that you have all the answers. And yet what I've found is that the the best of the best, the cream of the crop, they're always taking other people's workshops, they're always looking to learn something mm -hmm. new. Yeah, I think there's always something to learn from somebody else. Um, I'm fortunate that uh, I have a studio in Eastern Maryland where I, it's large enough where I, from time to time, invite other ins people in to give workshops in my studio. So I'm at the point now where I'm very careful who I invite. It has to be somebody whose work I really admire and uh, um, so that's been another part of my education. I think that's why in the last 10 years uh, I've, I've, I've been privileged to uh, see many fine artists give demos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't think of one where I didn't pick up some bit of information that was useful. So you started uh, at some point, you started plein air painting. Yeah. When did that all come about? That started around 2000. Um, I had been painting very happily in my studio, either from still lifes, occasionally from figures, and then landscapes from photos. You know, I saw no reason to go out and inconvenience myself. <laughs> but I had a, a very good friend who was a member of the Washington Society of Landscape Painters, mm -hmm. and she wanted me to join that group. And she says, well, we meet once a month and uh, we all go painting together. So she started dragging me out into uh, to nature, which I love. But, you know, I just didn't think the two mixed. And um, I started getting hooked. Uh, the first few times I went out, it was like I was so totally humbled. It was like, it's all green. <laughs> How it's, do you separate any, you know, it was just uh, well, totally the, frustrating. For, for a first time plein air painter, even somebody who's been in the studio their whole life, it's, it's overwhelming. It is overwhelming because in the studio you have control. You have control over the light. You have control over the placement of objects. Um, you, you just, you're comfortable, you know, it's not raining on you, the wind's not blowing. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a real challenge. And uh, I have to say, my work took a real step back. Um, if you looked at my landscape paintings from photographs, they were, they were pretty good, I was selling them. Uh, my plein air work was really bad, mm -hmm. really, really bad. And even now, sometimes it's really bad. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> but I began to realize that I was missing a lot 
by painting from photographs and only painting from the studio. So tell me more about that because this is a really important point that a lot of people don't get about plein air painting. Right, right. Um, well, I think the real uh, light bulb started going on when I studied with Ken Oster. Uh, I flew out to Tucson just because I had two friends who talked me into it. I didn't even know who he was. Um, I wasn't that interested in doing it, but it sounded like fun. So we flew out to Tucson and uh, Ken taught this workshop. And uh, he, he was a really gifted teacher. He was. And uh, he started talking about how you have to redesign a scene. And I was thinking, oh, you don't have to paint what's right in front of you. You know, you can move a telephone pole to, to tilt this way or move it a little bit or move, group the bushes together or make the road have a little better turn. All of these, you know, he's talking about all these things that you take control. You still want to honor the landscape. You want to uh, do a painting that is very evocative of where you were and the, the weather that day and the time of day, but you don't have to, you're not a photograph. You know, or a camera. You don't have to be like a camera. So, um, so then it became fun. Mm -hmm. You know, when I learned to um, quickly establish the light, and then make aesthetic decisions on what would be in my painting. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have to put everything in the painting. Uh, and I could move things a little bit and to make them work better in design, and and it, it became a real creative exercise. The other thing I think I've received from plein air painting, so I've been plein air painting now for 17 years, um, you, you get this, all this data of images that go into your head <laughs> that, you know, when you're, when you're working on a problem painting, you know, sometimes you can actually remember things from plein air painting or you can pull your sketches out and say, ah, yeah, that's how I did that or that's what would work here. And uh, I think you just become an all-around better painter. Even if you're not a purist and, you know, plein air painting is not your end-all or what you're marketing yourself to be, plein air painting is just a necessary part of being a good painter. It takes a, it takes a good studio painter and makes them a better painter. Absolutely. A and uh, I, I can't tell you how many dozens, if not hundreds of times, I've heard studio painters tell me that they resisted going mm -hmm. outside uh, for, for much of their career. They got frustrated in the beginning because it was difficult mm -hmm. and then they started seeing color, light, shape, form differently. Right. And, and then when you get out and you do it enough, then when you're painting from photographs, now those photographs reflect that that essence from the outdoors. Did you find that to be true in your case? Absolutely, absolutely. In my own plein air painting, at first, you know, it was the struggle, trying to mix the colors accurately, trying to uh, uh, work fast enough that the shadows weren't changing totally, trying to make an interesting painting on a gray day. All of these were, you know, huge challenges. But now I've gotten to the point where I've done enough of it, I, can, I quickly know the problems I'm going to face. That's the other thing Ken, Ken was really good at. He said, um, you need to analyze the scene before you start to paint. He said, take, take a few minutes and think, what are the problems going to be? How can I solve that problem? Um, mentally paint it in your head. Mm -hmm. And then you paint very, very quickly. And then you take a little break and you come back. And if you like what's there, then you finish the painting. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a matter, he calls, you know, I'm really quoting him a lot and I hope that's all right. Of course. He, he called painting a passion sandwich and I love that analogy because, you know, the bread is the, uh, the analytical part of the painting and then you paint passionately, that's all the filling, and then you analyze again. Mm -hmm. And you may have a triple decker where you're, you're going back from an, an analyzing to painting passionately to analyzing painting passionately. But um, that is the way painting really uh, is. It's a, a constant left brain, right brain shift mm -hmm. back and forth all the time. So um, once I got that concept, I learned to slow down in the beginning, analyze how I was going to approach it, then paint quickly. Mm -hmm. and then step back and analyze again. And, and, and I think that, that some people believe that have to have a perfectly finished painting when they're outdoors. What do you believe? 
Well, in a competition, yes. But no, just for a plein air painting for myself, no, it doesn't have to be finished. Mm -hmm. um, I have learned some tricks, um, how to, I've, got, I've reached the point where I'm not satisfied with just painting what's in front of me. Um, I want my painting to have interesting texture. Mm -hmm. And so I've been exploring ways to do that in a plein air painting. And one of the things I do when I'm outside and painting a fairly large painting is I will paint most of it well, I make, I'll make all of my color decisions, my shape decisions, my design and drawing in acrylic. And I'll do that very thinly. So I'll have a thin base of um, a fairly completed painting. And then I'll go in with, with my oil, with um, palette knives and different tools. And I, I do a lot of layering, which I didn't think was possible, uh, you know, 10 years ago. I thought plein air painting had to be pretty straightforward. But now I've reached the point where I can, I can do that, and uh, it makes it even more fun. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you picked up a handful of dirt and stuck that it on there. That happens naturally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once in a while when the panel blows that over. That happens, yeah. Well, I, I think the point of all of this is that the, um, the frustration of learning in the beginning when you go outdoors has a big payoff. Absolutely. And the big payoff is that you, you will see painting from a completely different perspective. We try to encourage a lot of studio painters to get outside. It's amazing how many thousands there are have never gone outside and painted yet. Yeah. This, yeah. The, so there's this movement now mm -hmm. of painters. You kind of came on board about the time that movement was just starting yes. to really catch on and, and, yes. and take hold. So we started Plein Air Magazine two, two years after you started Plein plein air painting, so you were yes. ahead of us. Yeah, it's really interesting how that all happened. Um, I don't know if you know that I was one of the founders of Plein Air Easton. Yes, I do know that, okay. and I was going to ask you about that. Well, what the way it happened, I, the same friend that had gotten me to go to Tucson to study with Ken Oster, um, she was actually in the Carmel Plein Air uh, event mm -hmm. that year, it was 2004. Mm -hmm. And she invited me to go out with her, so I went out with her and was just as an observer. And uh, I just loved it. I, all these wonderful artists out there painting, and the quick draw was especially exciting. I remember watching um, an artist named Tim Horn and Joe Wang do uh, portraits of each other out in the open, and I thought, wow, there's just nothing more exciting or fun than this. And uh, the interesting thing was, at the exact same time, my husband and I were buying a, a gallery in a little town called Easton, Maryland. And that came about because I had uh, been an artist in this gallery. I was living on it near uh, uh, southern Maryland, on the other side of Chesapeake Bay. I don't know if you're familiar with the geography there, but it was mm -hmm. a couple hours away. And I would go to Easton and drop off my work and then leave and go, mm -hmm. go home. But, Different things conspired to uh, eventually have us own this gallery, and, and we moved to Easton. And Easton's a, a charming little town on the eastern shore, which is mostly agricultural, but it's a very sophisticated little town because mm -hmm. uh, it's a retirement area for people from Washington and Baltimore, Philly. And uh, so anyhow, I, I, we bought this gallery, and all this talk about plein air painting was, you know, going on, it was buzz. And then I heard that some guy was gonna start a magazine about plein air painting. You know, that was really awesome. <laughs> and then I also heard that the town of Easton was uh, looking for another uh, arts event. It had kind of built itself as a little arts town. It had a, a major uh, wildlife arts festival that had been going on there for uh, close to 40 years at that time. Really? And, but the festival was, like all things do, it was, had, it was starting to wane a bit and the town felt they needed another uh, art festival. So I said, boy, have I got an idea for you. <laughs> so uh, I went to the um, economic development officer of the town, uh, Al Bond, and I pitched the idea to him. And I was also uh, kind of gently nudged by Ross Merrill, who had, uh, Ross was, um, a big proponent of plein air painting. I knew him from Washington Society of uh, Landscape Painters, and Ross Merrill also had worked for the National Gallery for many years. So he had a real overview of um, art movements and art history, and he kept saying, Nancy, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. So he helped me uh, make up a, uh, uh, 
what do you call it, document that would convince the town fathers that this was the thing they needed to do. So anyhow, they loved the idea. We pulled together a consortium of business owners, individual artists, uh, the Academy Art Museum, which is an accredited art museum in Easton, Maryland, and uh, Easton Main Street organization. And uh, we did that in January of 2005. And uh, we had our first plein air event in July of 2005. So that so, event has kind of become the premier event in the plein air world. It's, one, it's yeah, Definitely. I think it has. What, what do you think is the reason that event has, has kind of become the standard? What is it that they do differently that, and, and they did it out of the box. Mm -hmm. Or you did it out of the box. Well, I think one of the, there were other events starting at the same time, like uh, plein air Annapolis, and I forget who else was the same year, but um, the big thing with Easton was it had no competition. In the middle of the summer, there was nothing going on in that little village. <laughs> you know, we had all these businesses and restaurants, and you know nobody was coming in. They're all getting in their cars and driving straight to the Atlantic Ocean and bypassing Easton. So, um, and the fact that nothing was going on made everybody embrace it. The, uh, the volunteer, the town got all excited about it. Um, there were people, it's a very sophisticated town and uh, full of people that come from other careers, had know-how, knew how to do things, um, knew how to publicize, knew how to sell tickets. But I think the other thing that was really important from the get-go, our very first, first donor, uh, his name was Tim Dills and he's since passed on, but. He was a, a businessman who loved art, and he said, I'll give you $10,000, but I want it all to go to the artist. And, which meant we had to raise the rest of the money, but that $10,000 all went to the artist in the form of prize money. And um, I think because we started off with really good prize money, um, we got good artists, and uh, we had good people managing it, and wonderful volunteers. Um, a community that totally embraced um, the idea, even though they didn't even know what it was about. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget, um, my, one of my best friends was a volunteer coordinator, and like five days before the event was to start, she said, I just can't get any volunteers. She said, I have only a handful, everybody's busy. And um, then the artist started coming to town, and uh, we had this really good-looking artist from Chicago, and it was hot in Easton in July. And he's out painting on the bypass, and uh, he took his shirt off. And all of a sudden, she got all, started getting all these calls. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, I think I'd like to volunteer. <laughs> so sex sells. I guess. Even in plein air painting. <laughs> so anyhow, it just, you know, the first year, it, uh, it was successful. It was, we made 50000 in sales. And every year, it has gone up, you know, exponentially. And... Uh, so I, I really think maybe at this point, because there's lots of organizations that, that have kind of copied us and they're doing a good job. Um, San Angelo on Plein Air, Texas has really taken off because they have really studied Easton. But I also, I think the one advantage Easton has that most of them don't have is that, again, it doesn't have any competition yeah. during that time of the year. All eyes are on that event. So what do you think about this entire plein air movement? <laughs> uh, because there are mixed feelings yeah. that we hear. Um, you know, the feelings we hear are, some artists will say, well, there's too many events, or there's not enough artists to do high quality events. Yeah. Others will say, you know, we're putting uncooked artists into the market. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are now, probably since we started the magazine, you know, when we started the magazine, there probably were less than a handful of events, um, yeah. you know, and, and today there are 150, 200 of them, and every year we learn of another mm -hmm. 20 or 30 that are, that are starting, right. uh, because communities and charities are finding it a great way to raise money. Right. So what's the upside, what's the downside? Well, I've, it's funny you ask, because I have certainly um, have gone through many phases of how I feel about the movement. Um, having, at that time, being a gallery owner, 
at first it was very good for our gallery and, and then I began to realize that it was not good for the gallery because as the event became more popular, uh, people stopped buying in the gallery. And uh, I, you know, I had a, I worried about that a lot. I felt bad about the galleries in our town that had supported the event who now were feeling the, uh, the negative effect of all the, the money being spent there. The recession happened at the same time too. Right, in our right. third year, the recession happened and, and people weren't buying all year long. They were saving their money to buy at one time and it was much more fun to buy from plein air event than just a regular gallery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of things cons conspired. Um, the internet also was a big thing. So I had to go through this kind of resentment like, oh, what have we done? We've opened this Pandora's box. and. Um, step back and really take a long view because um, I truly do believe this is an art movement that will be written about by historians a hundred years from now. Yeah, this it's, is this is the largest art movement in the yeah, history of art. Yeah, and it has brought, it's brought artists to art. I mean, it's brought many people that wanted to paint into the act, act of painting, so it's created a whole new industry of workshops, which is good for professional artists. Um, but even more than that, it has made collectors of people who would never dream of going into a gallery and buying an original piece of art. Because I saw that. Because why? Well, galleries always, you know, for some people they were elitist or um, intimidating. Intimidating, and uh, you have to be really rich to buy money, buy paintings from a gallery, and so a lot of people just didn't. They just bought prints or um, photographs, which nothing wrong with photographs. I think you know there's definitely an art uh, to photography and and photograph prints, but um, oil paintings and original one of a kind paintings were just kind of out of the reach of a lot of people, hence my own parents, you know, would never dream of buying an original piece of art. But seeing the artists out on the street, uh, stopping and chatting with them, getting the invitation to come to see them at the quick draw or come to the, the, the show, which is, you know, there's no fee to get into the show, um, started bringing people in and, and they fell in love. Oh, I saw that artist paint that, you know, and then they, you know, the price point was relatively low. At some of the events, it's very low, mm -hmm. and then, you know, at the better events, the price point is, you know, is certainly moving up the entry level, but it's still affordable for a, the vast majority of uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. And I can remember this one woman who worked for the city of Easton, who sh she she bought her first oil painting, and uh, just. The happiness, you know, the the fear, the pride she had in in purchasing that from an artist, and every time I run into her, she, you know, she still talks about that. And it wasn't the only one she bought every year. She was not buying the many thousand dollar paintings, but she was buying the three or four hundred dollar paintings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think introducing, uh, you know, people to the possibility of owning an original piece of artwork is a, a huge benefit of the plein air movement. And there's nothing like going into a house filled with original art. Oh yeah. It's, you know, I've gone into the homes of billionaires who have Thomas Kincaid prints on the wall. Right. And then you walk into somebody's house, maybe somebody doesn't have a lot of money, but they've filled it with a lot of even two or three, four hundred dollar paintings. Right. And there's just something that enriches, is that a word? Uh, enriches that, enriches, that yeah. life, that, that um, it, it enriches that, that household and it mm -hmm. makes it feel a, a little bit more special. It does. It really does. So do you still have the gallery? No, we sold the gallery um, last year to a wonderful guy who's an art lover and a fledgling artist and an architect. So, <laughs> so uh, you're active in the plein air movement. Yes. You're painting landscapes, are you doing any more portrait work? I do, Okay. although I, now I only do portraits from life. Um, I've learned, I, I don't do a lot of portraits. I made a decision maybe 15 years ago that um, that was not what I wanted to do. Um, I, I had a portrait uh, get into the Naval Academy uh, Museum collection and 
and you know, and I was stra strangely not all that excited about it. <laughs> and, I, and that's kind of about the time um, uh, I started going out and painting plein air. And I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed being a gallery artist, and I just enjoy the flexibility of being able to paint what I want to paint. Do you use photographs at all anymore? Oh yeah, I okay. use them all the time in the studio. Um, I also try to paint from life in the studio, um, but I've you know photographs are now just a small mm -hmm. part of my toolbox. Right, not the not the major part. Not the major part, yeah. not at all. And uh, that's one thing I enjoy doing is teaching people how to use photographs the correct way, and and putting them where they belong, you know, becoming the boss, not letting the photograph be the boss. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to do. It is hard to do, yeah. and, and it takes constant vigilance when you're painting to, to make, always make decisions, not just, you know, uh, blindly paint what you see. Well, when that photograph photo. is there, it's real easy to keep defaulting to that photograph Very instead easy. of making an artistic decision. Yep. That's exactly right. In terms of your career, what 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 have you not done that you want to do? Is there a ultimate painting you've wanted to do, or some kind of an event that, that you'd like to do? Well, I've I've wanted to demonstrate for the plein air convention, and fortunately, I'm going to be able to do that this year. So, uh, looking forward to that. As are we. Thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing bigger and bigger paintings. Uh, and which I have in the last few years been doing that in, in my studio. I have a, a nice large spot, a place to paint. Um, I'm doing more urban scenes. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I, it may have been a workshop with Quang Ho where I transitioned from painting things to painting shapes. And so I'm really attracted to interesting shapes now and it really doesn't matter whether it's a an urban scene, a rural landscape, a portrait, a figure, a still life, it has to have interesting shapes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm finding that in urban scenes. Um, you know, some very uninteresting uh, scenes can make a really uh, interesting painting. Like last year, or actually if you look at the current issue of Fine Art Connoisseur, I have a small uh, uh, image of a painting I did last year called Power Play, mm -hmm. and it was um, a uh, electric plant that I saw from uh, a window of a train as I was traveling south <laughs> from Richmond to Florida. And uh, it was just a very arresting image to me, and, and I had a lot of fun dealing with the shapes in, in that image, so uh, doing more like that. I would like get, to get back to doing some more figurative work, um, and uh, I, I am doing that. Uh, the shows that I have will contain some of that. Um, I guess I just want to keep doing what I do, stay as healthy as I can, uh, enjoy life, and, uh, and just constantly strive to become a better painter. So if you have any advice to somebody who might be watching this, who is perhaps a beginner or just kind of, you know, getting started as a painter, what advice would that be? Um, learn the concepts. Learn all the, inter the things you need to know um, to be able to express yourself, and that was, is drawing, design, value, color, edges, paint application. Study with somebody who's a good teacher who can um, explain those concepts, con concepts to you in a coherent way. Um, learn your own personal aesthetic, and this is something I had to do. Um, I, my, my skills were pretty good, but I liked hard edge work, and I liked soft edge work, and I liked semi-abstract work, and I liked photorealist work, and I, I found myself going to all these different um, types of painting and doing them. Um, I'm not a, a highly detailed painter. I like um, action, I like movement, I like color, I like a variety of edges. And uh, so I thought, well, yeah, that's who I am. And so unapologetically, I you know, have gone forward and tried to paint 
who I am and not who somebody else is. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing wrong with somebody who is highly detailed. Uh, you know, that's a wonderful skill to have and they produce beautiful paintings, but it's not me. I'm, I'm more of a big picture person, I think. You also, it's interesting because it, just listening to you, you've gone through di different phases. Oh, absolutely. Right. So I think that's something everybody can expect yeah. too, is that you're, you know, and, and as you get more comfortable with concepts and, and the idea of moving paint around or having, the, having this become second nature, once you get that down, then you can kind of go through your path, which is... Yeah, and it, and it will come naturally. It's like your signature. You know, you, you can't escape your natural way of signing your name and your natural way of painting your, your own personal aesthetic will, will come out. But you have to do the hard work first. Don't think you're going to, uh, you know, start painting masterpieces in a few years. Some people might. There, you know, there are people that are more, um, I, get, I don't know if the word's talented or gifted or just have, are able to grasp the skills, just the way their brain works, their, maybe their hand-eye coordination might be better than the next person. So for some people, their development will come faster than others. But I truly believe that um, people can be taught mm -hmm. and they can be taught um, the skills they need to paint well. The truly greats are people that have kind of transcended that, uh, transcended that, where the skills become sec second nature and what they're trying to say are their own personal um, way of seeing things starts to come, come out. But what, what do all the truly great artists have in common? Originality? True. I think the other thing is that they just paint a lot. Oh yeah, you know, ten thousand miles yeah. of canvas, or uh, ten thousand hours to take yeah. a master. And Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book about that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It takes time. Yeah, you just have to be, and that's something that I, I, I think encouraging artists because I, again, my goal is to help people find it and then help them not give up, because yeah. too many people, you know, they get started and they just they think that, you know, they'll they'll say. Um, uh, it's about talent, and I, I think that some people do have some natural talent, but most of it is process. And, you know, they don't go to a concert. They don't go and listen to a concert pianist and believe that that person didn't start out playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. Right. And yet, they, for some reason, they think when you're an artist, you just have this natural talent. And, and I'm trying to overcome that perception among people and help them realize, look, just get out there, keep practicing, just get some mileage, and yeah. that mileage... Of course, once you get mileage, then you have to get instruction from really great people like you because that will help you take big leaps fast. Absolutely. There's, there's, yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, I think workshops are really, uh, it's good to have a, a teacher in your own hometown, but I don't, for some reason, I don't think people learn as fast with weekly you know, they, they will learn, and I have my own students that study with me um, once a week when I'm at home. But I think when you go to a workshop, you get everything concentrated, you know. You're, well, you're away from your you're environment. You're away from your, exactly. It's all about art. That's all the workshop's about, and that's what you talk about at dinner, and that's what you think about when you go to bed. And... Um, it's it's interesting, you know, and then you leave the workshop and a lot of it leaves your head, but some of it will stay. And if just one important concept informs your work going on, you know, after that, you know, the workshop will have been worth it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so take, I, I, I advise people to take as many as their budget can afford, but allow enough painting time between the workshops that they can really paint and explore the new concepts they've learned um, before going on to somebody else who may have a totally different way of teaching. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Eric. I've enjoyed it. That was Nancy Tankersley, and the video is Painting Figures from Photographs. If you want to learn more, go to lilyartvideo.com. I'm Eric Rhodes. Imagine how great it would be learning to paint multiple figures in one single painting. 
After all, the ability to bring the human form to life on a canvas is a skill many people marvel at, though it's not just painters who look in awe upon such work. People with no great interest in art are still mesmerized by lifelike paintings of the human form. For many years, however, the only way to create such a realistic piece of art was to stand outside for hours on end, painting every detail as lighting conditions change. Yet thanks to the invention of cameras, you can now capture every detail in a photograph and paint figures in the comfort of your own home or studio. With this all-new release from Lilidal Art Instruction Video, you now have the chance to learn how to produce such paintings yourself. This video training is conducted by leading figure painter Nancy Tankersley. When you master the skill of painting from photos, you'll save a lot of time that would otherwise be spent outside, no matter the conditions. In this training, you will discover Nancy's advanced method of making one painting from two separate photos. The truth about adding detail to a face in your painting when you can't see any of the original photograph. The box technique Nancy uses to paint two figures right next to each other. Plus, a whole lot more, including how to paint the sky in just 19 seconds while still ensuring it looks realistic. Learning to paint from photographs is a skill many figure painters wish they possessed. Now, thanks to Nancy's teaching method, acquiring this skill for yourself is now a real possibility. Painting Figures from Photographs with Nancy Tankersley is available on DVD and streaming video now.